Joy Again, a teaching series through the book of Philippians. Today we go into chapter 3, and I know last week, chapter 2, we had to leave some parts of that behind, some very rich parts, but this is just an overview, and I hope you have been benefiting from it so far. If you've missed any of the first two segments, uh, the book of Philippians is known as the epistle, the letter of joy. It's a letter filled with admonitions for joy. It's a letter expressing where Paul's joy came from. And as a brief recap, here is what we have learned so far. As it relates to Paul's sources of joy, he starts out in chapter 1 with joy because he is thankful for his partners in ministry. And I just want to say briefly here, Man, I, I just, we, we, we thank God for the pastors and their wives and our group leaders. What fills my heart with joy, I am so thankful for Wendy Felix, our kids ministry director, and our whole kids ministry team who are serving our children and serving our families, even in the midst of social distancing, even in the midst of not being able to meet and when we take a moment to thank God for the kids' ministry, there is joy in knowing we have partners in the gospel. Someone say amen. Someone type amen. How many of you are thankful, and maybe the kids who are watching, how many of you are thankful for your teachers who are leading you to see Jesus uh, every week, whether it's on Zoom calls or handouts that you can follow along with during the service. I am thankful for partners in ministry like our kids' ministry leaders. I'm also reminded of our partner in ministry, Foster the Bay. Foster the Bay is an organization that has one heartbeat, and that is that churches would foster children that every children would have a home and that it would be people who are in Christian churches who are on the front lines of fostering children and wrapping around families that are fostering children. And so we began this partnership about two uh, years ago and no one yet from our church has actually gone through the process of fostering a child of their own. But what we have done as a church is wrap uh, foster parents with support. And so just a few weeks ago, we uh, have the opportunity and had the opportunity to wrap our second family, our second family who uh, has foster children, uh, and they're in the San Leandro area. And so many of our San Leandro families, several of our San Leandro families are wrapping this family with support and love. And so I'm thankful I'm thankful for Foster the Bay. I'm thankful for the people in our church who are taking initiative around fostering children and supporting foster parents. We praise God for that. And, and I hope you have some moments in your week where you, like Paul, are filled with joy because you're expressing gratitude for partners in the ministry. I'm thankful for advancing of the gospel. Paul was thankful that the gospel was advancing even though he was in chains. How many of you were encouraged last week by Kinlock's baptism? Come on, somebody. The gospel is advancing. And there's a couple more people. We've got to praise God. There's a couple more people that have identified themselves, that they want to go back, uh, get baptized and go public with their faith. The gospel is being advanced want to tell you about a phone call I had this week with a brother who has been serving the Lord 20 plus years, been in ministry for a long time, actually was a part of planting a church over the last seven years or so, but shared that he was just feeling burnt out. He and his wife were feeling burnt out and dry and, and really were looking for something fresh, looking for God to do something new. And over the last four weeks or so, this couple who's known the Lord for a very long time started tuning in to our services here at the movement. And I got to hear the testimony of their faith being revived and renewed and feeling like the messages were going from their head to their heart. 
The fact that God would not only, more important than just drawing people to the movement, but that God would reach people in such a way where He would revive tired faith that he would revive a faith that has not uh, experienced vibrancy over the last several weeks. I am thankful that the gospel message of Jesus Christ is not only advancing to the ears of new believers, but it is acting as a refreshment to people who have been following Jesus for a long time. There is much joy in thanksgiving for partners, in advancing of the gospel, in persevering in faith. As I am doing my best to persevere, as you are doing your best to persevere, I bet you are seeing fruit from that perseverance. I am experiencing fruit because I'm staying in the game and that brings me joy. And then last week, we took a look at joy coming from unity in the body of Christ specifically through humility, specifically through focusing and keeping our eyes fixed on the self-humiliation of Jesus Christ. And I just want to say, our church, even through these times, and maybe because of these times, is becoming more unified. I've spoke to some of our group leaders leading our uh, group study through this curriculum called Undivided where we're looking at racial reconciliation from a biblical perspective. And I've got to tell you, folks, rich conversations are happening. Apologies are going forward. Repentance is taking place. Racism is being recognized by people of all ethnicities in our church. It's being confessed. Empathy is being experienced. Folks, the movement church is experiencing a greater degree of unity through humility, and that should bring us joy. And so many reasons here for us to have joy again, but why don't you turn to your neighbor, put in the comments, there's more, there's more, come on somebody. As if this wasn't enough, there are more reasons, and you might say, Ed, none of these reasons have brought me joy, and I would just say, if that's the case, man, man, I want to meet you where you're at, I really do, But come on, this is good stuff. This is good stuff. But even if you're in a place of of this is not enough, I got something for you today. And so the tension question, plain and simple, is what else? What else can bring our joy back again? More than thanksgiving, more advancement of the gospel, more than unity through humility, more than these things, is there anything else? What else can bring us joy And let me remind you, in week one, I just, you know, a lot of definitions of joy. I I just came up with this one, that joy is an inner gladness undeterred by outward circumstances. When we talk about rescuing joy, experiencing joy again, it's that inner gladness that no matter how bad things are on the outside, it can't touch the joy that we have on the inside. And maybe you would just take a moment of self-reflection. Here, a couple weeks into the series, what is your level of joy? This last week, was, was there an inner gladness undeterred by the tough things that you faced, by the tough things that you saw, by the news that continues to pour in that seems so negative and so polarizing? How was your level of joy? And I have one burden this week, one burden. I, I may have mentioned it before, but I just want to say it more clearly and specifically now. The reason I hope you lean in, the reason I think this topic is important is this. Our joy, your joy, is too dependent on what God is or isn't doing and not on what He has already done. This is a tragedy, friends, that the level of our happiness the level of our joy, the level of our gladness, it's too dependent. It's too dependent on whether or not God is providing in the way you want Him to provide, on whether He is healing in the way you want Him to heal, in the way He's not restoring the racial injustices fast enough. People are forgetting. He, he, it's not front and center like it was just a few weeks ago. And so you find your joy slipping because of what God is or isn't doing. 
And we need to have our joy rooted in the unchangeable character of God. Then and only then can we have this inner gladness undeterred by outward circumstances. Until it's rooted in the unchanging character of God, we are going to find ourselves longing for joy, waiting for Him to do something. Is your joy dependent on 2020 being over? (laughs) Come on. Is your joy dependent on the turning of the calendar? Is your joy dependent about shelter in place being lifted? Is your joy dependent on being able to eat inside of restaurants? Come on, somebody. I mean, mine kind of is, if I'm being honest. I just want to eat inside restaurants again. Is your joy connected to when you're not going to be criticized for not wearing a mask? Come on, somebody. If your joy is connected to these things, You're going to be waiting. That's my burden. And so today, Philippians 3, Philippians 3 is going to help us, I think, in some profound ways with how we can have joy that doesn't depend on whether we have masks or don't have masks, whether we have a vaccine or don't have a vaccine, whether you're working from home or not working from home, whether you're homeschooling the kids or not homeschooling the kids, whether the money's great or the money's not so great, What if you could have joy regardless? I think Philippians 3 helps us with this. And so here's our outline for today. Here's the roadmap for today's message. When you look at Philippians 3, as you read through the first 11 verses, that's all I've got time for today, we're going to see an imperative to obey, a warning to heed, a very necessary exchange if you want to have a joy that's undeterred by outward circumstances, you have to make the exchange that Paul makes, and I'll talk about that when we get there. It's a glorious gospel to embrace, and then we see two pathways to intimacy. Now, I've got to tell you, these first four parts, I'm excited about them. I think they're beautiful. I think there are things we need to be reminded of, maybe some things you don't know, but they're, they're beautiful things. But, but this last one, pathways to intimacy. We're going to look at two pathways to knowing Christ that are going to blow our minds, that are going to encourage us. I have high expectations for how God is going to speak to us through these pathways to intimacy. But we've got some work to do before we get there. And so let's jump into the text, into the text to find out very quickly what is the imperative to obey. Here's Paul writing to the church at Philippi, and he is bound in chains. And what does he say? He says, whatever happens, my dear brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. I never get tired of telling you these things, and I do it to safeguard your faith. Rejoice in the Lord. In another place he says, I believe it's maybe even chapter 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. I never get tired of telling you these things. In this letter, he says it multiple times. Rejoice in the Lord. Have joy in God. Have joy in Jesus Christ. That's the imperative to obey. And so let's take a look just In summary, make Jesus your source of joy. Make Jesus your source of joy. That's the imperative. Rejoice in the Lord. Now, for every one of these points, I've got five points. I've got a question for you to consider. Why doesn't Jesus bring you joy? For those of you this past week who have not had joy, Why hasn't Jesus been enough? Why hasn't Jesus, and and let's just be honest. He hasn't been enough because he hasn't done enough for me. He hasn't been enough because he hasn't answered my prayer. It's okay. I'm I'm not going to criticize you for how you feel. We just have to look internally and ask ourselves, especially as Christians, Why is this imperative to make Jesus our source of joy? Why is this difficult? 
So why doesn't Jesus bring you joy? I mean, maybe some of you would even put in the comments. You'd be so bold to say, Jesus doesn't bring me joy because I don't think I've spent time with him. I don't want to spend time with him. Jesus doesn't bring me joy because I see him more as a taskmaster to obey than a savior to behold. I mean, let's just get to the bottom of why Jesus doesn't bring us joy because Christians so easily, it's like, yeah, Jesus is my joy or how are you doing? Oh, I'm blessed and highly favored, you know, but in the quiet moments of our lives, the person of Jesus Christ isn't enough. Rejoice in the Lord, Paul says. And and maybe this warning to heed, as we move along here, this warning to heed will help explain maybe why Jesus isn't enough. Now, this is a a fairly big portion of the text here, all under this warning to heed section. And I'm going to do my best to break it down as simply as possible But for Jesus to be our joy, we have to be careful of something. Jesus won't be our joy if we're not careful of this thing that I'm about to talk about and that Paul talks about. Let's see the warning to heed that Paul says. He says, watch out. That's a warning. Watch out for those dogs, those people who do evil, those mutilators who say you must be circumcised to be saved. Watch out. He uses three phrases, dogs, evildoers, and mutilators. Who the heck is Paul talking about? What he's talking about is a group of religious people in that day called Judaizers. Turn to your neighbor and say Judaizers, okay? Try to spell it. You won't be able to, guarantee it. Judaizers is not spelt how it sounds, okay? Judaizers were religious people who upheld the law even though they were in the New Testament reality of Jesus Christ. So, for example, Judaizers would expect Gentiles to be circumcised as a way to be grafted into the family of God. They still believe that the Old Testament law of circumcision had to be practiced not only by Gentiles, but also by Jews who had yet to be circumcised. And so here Paul is basically calling them out. You who think you're upholding the law the most, you're actually the dogs. You're actually the ones who are of the lowest caste. You're the ones who do evil. You're mutilators. Even though you want people to be circumcised, to be grafted into the family of God, you're really mutilators. It's not something that you're asking people to do to be brought closer to God, but you're actually allowing the law to stand in between people and God. And he says, for we worship, okay, because these are these are the fake ones, the Judaizers, still upholding the law, for we worship worship by the Spirit of God are the ones who are truly circumcised. We're, our hearts are circumcised by the gospel of Jesus Christ. We no longer have to have physical circumcision, but our hearts are circumcised by the gospel. We rely on what Christ Jesus has done for us. We don't rely on law keeping. We rely on what Christ Jesus has done for us. We put no confidence in human effort. Though I could have, okay, so he's saying, don't be like the Judaizers putting the weight on following the law. He says, us real believers, those who are really circumcised by, through the Holy Spirit, we rely on what Christ Jesus has done. No confidence in human effort. And then he goes on to describe why if there's anyone who should put confidence in human effort, it's him. If there is anyone who could actually put some confidence in their human effort, it's Paul. Look how he says it. He goes, indeed, if others have reasons for confidence in their own efforts, I have even more. Sounds kind of arrogant to me. He's like, if anyone's got the resume, I've got the best resume. Let's look at what he says. I was circumcised when I was eight days old. 
What does that mean? That basically means he followed, his parents followed the letter of the law. As soon as a child was supposed to get circumcised, which was on the eighth day, which was the law, he did. He wasn't a 10-day guy, okay? He wasn't a 25-day guy. He wasn't a 35-year-old, oh, come on, somebody. Like, that happened in that day, just so you know. Like, being of age, and you got to get grafted in, so let's, okay? He was an eight-day guy. I'm a pure-blooded citizen of Israel and a member of the tribe of Benjamin, the tribe of Benjamin was the only tribe to enter into the promised land. So it's like, so this is, okay, this is what you call, he had some serious uh, love for his heritage, for his ethnicity. I'm a pure-blooded citizen of Israel, no, no mixed blood in me. And I'm a member of the best tribe. There were 12 tribes of Israel. He was a part of the tribe of Benjamin. And basically, that was the best tribe to be a part of. That was the holiest tribe, the tribe that did it the most right. Because we know those other tribes got it all types of wrong. A real Hebrew if there ever was one. Some translations say a Hebrew of Hebrews. It's like, I'm a Filipino of all the Filipinos, okay? This guy was proud of his inherent gifts that he was given from birth. Things that he had nothing to do with were part of his resume. And then he goes on to say things that he had to do with. I was a member of the Pharisees. So out of all the religious groups, I was a part of the sect that upheld the law in the strictest way. He was a Pharisee who demanded the strictest obedience. Oh, I, I, that was my explanation, but it's what he said. The strictest obedience to the Jewish law. I was so zealous. Not only was, was, did I uphold it, but I was zealous and I harshly persecuted the church. I was a zealot. I was on fire for God. I was on the front lines. I was, I was making a wreck of things. I was making sure that people were doing the right thing and as for righteousness, you want to talk to me about righteousness? I obeyed the law without fault. Wow, Paul, wow. And when he says this, just for clarification, it's not that he never sinned, but when he did sin, he obeyed all the laws that would make him right with God. He did all the sacrifices, all the things, all the things, all the things. And so, he criticizes the Judaizers for upholding the law, and he says, if there's anyone who, who has confidence in, in upholding the law, it, it should be me. So let's jump to it here. What's the warning to heed? Don't root your joy in your righteousness. Watch out, he says. A warning to heed. Watch out for the mentality of the Judaizers. And let me give you this resume and he's going to say in a minute, this isn't the way to go. I'm going to talk about the exchange in just a second, but stay away. And here's the question to consider. We're going to come back around to it. What acts of righteousness do you pride yourself in most? What acts of righteousness do you pride yourself in most? Tony Evans has this to say uh, in his commentary about this passage. He says this, If we place our confidence in our accomplishments or in anything other than Christ, we will find it impossible to rejoice when things don't go well. I want you to see the connection between placing the confidence in your righteousness and uh, not experiencing joy again. He goes on to say here, when we struggle in our marriages or in our careers, we'll be miserable if we've placed our confidence in things. To be steady and joyful in all circumstances, we must place our confidence in Jesus. What we place our confidence in has a huge impact in our ability to maintain joy in the midst of difficult circumstances. Let me flesh this out for you. Let's say you place your joy in your ability to be physically well. You work out all the time, you eat well, you honor God with your body, you're on that whole tip, I'm just jealous, but let me just work this out. If you have confidence and if your resume of how you take care of yourself physically is your confidence before God, what happens when you fail? 
What happens when you break the diet? What happens when you get off the workout program? What happens when you become physically ill and can't even do the things you once wanted to do? Then you can't have joy because your joy was was laying on something you were accomplishing. And when you can't accomplish it anymore, then your joy is lost. You following me? Financially, if, if you have your standing before God or your righteousness before God that you tithe and you give and you're responsible with your money and you save, and we're not saying these things are bad, they just can't be the root of your joy. Your righteousness can't be the root of your joy. So your financial righteousness, what happens when you lose a job? What happens when you don't have the finances you once had? What happens when finances get taken away from you? Now you can't have joy because your act of righteousness can't even be executed anymore. Relationally, if you have joy in the the quality of your friendships, in the way you manage those friendships, in the way how you're so likable and accepted by others, your joy will be threatened when people don't like you. Your joy will be threatened when people don't affirm you. Your joy will be threatened when people don't hang out with you. Your joy will be threatened when you can't have the things that you want relationally. So be careful that the act of relational righteousness that you have, marital, parental, man, I'm a great husband, I'm a great wife, I'm a great parent. What happens if you lose your spouse? What happens if your child walks away from the Lord? What happens if you don't have a relationship with your child anymore? If this becomes the source of your joy, what happens when your marriage fails? Does that mean joy is an impossibility for you? What happens when your kids don't turn out the way or they're in a season where you're grieving? Does that mean joy is an impossibility? If your joy, and this is the tricky one, if it's rooted in your faithfulness to God, in reading the scriptures and going to church and volunteering. What happens when you have a week when you don't read the Bible? What happens when you have a a rough week and you don't want to serve? And Does that mean you can't have joy because your spiritual disciplines have... What are we placing our joy in? I know this real personally. We'll move on. Mine, it's, it's pastoral, right? A lot of my greatest joys are because of of what I believe God is doing in and through me as a pastor. But I've got to be careful because if I prop that up as my righteousness through which I find joy, here's what happened. George Floyd gets murdered. Racial reconciliation becomes the talk, becomes the direction, becomes the emphasis as it should be. And because I've propped myself up as a pastor who leads a multi-ethnic church and and who um, has black people who love this church and who are a part of this church, when I hear from some of the black people in our church that I haven't done as good of a job as I could do, that there are some blind spots in how I'm leading our church forward, what happens to my joy? I experienced this, friends, Because I put so much emphasis on being a great multi-ethnic pastor, multicultural, pastor of a multi-ethnic, multicultural church, when I realized I wasn't doing as good of a job as maybe I thought I was, I lost my joy. I lost my joy. Feelings of depression, feelings of sadness came over me because, ah, I need everyone to like me. I need everyone to think I'm awesome. Maybe we just be honest for a moment and you'd you'd put in the comments an area that that you've rooted your righteousness and and your joy has been rooted in righteousness in one of these areas. Hopefully we could see. Do you see how that's why joy could be fickle? Now, let's, let's get more positive. Let's see the exchange to make. What's the exchange we need to make? This is what Paul did. Uh, some commentators look at this passage almost like, almost like Paul's testimony. Before Christ, I, I looked at my resume, my inherent blessings, 
my Hebrewness, my eighth day circumcisedness. And I held that up as, as my resume of righteousness. But then here's the exchange I made. Here was the Damascus Road moment, not just like when Jesus saved me on that road, but, but the internal saving that happened. Look what happened to Paul. He says, I once thought these things were valuable. My resume, my righteousness, my Phariseeness, I once thought these things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless. Everyone say worthless. Now I consider them worthless. Now I want to make this point. It's not that they are worthless. He just considers them worthless. Why? Because of what Christ has done. Yet everything else is worthless, not because having a good marriage is worthless, not because being a good pastor is worthless, not because taking care of your physical health is worthless. It's just worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. What he once found most valuable, he then saw as worthless. And what was the exchange? Infinite value of knowing Jesus Christ is what became most important to him. He goes and he closes this part by saying, For his sake I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage, rubbage. This word can be translated dung, crap. There's a four-letter cuss word that you could put in there. That's what he's talking about. Why? Said I, so that I could gain Christ and become one with him. This is an important exchange, friends. It's not enough that you just recognize your resume and not put your faith in your resume as your source of joy. It's important that you make this exchange. I said it this way. Root your joy in what's infinitely valuable, not in what's temporarily valuable. The infinite value of knowing Christ. And maybe you need to work this out at some point this week. Because you haven't thought about it enough. Because you've got kids and you've got a job and plenty of things to do. And Ed, only you have time to think about these things. But let me just ask you, why is knowing Christ of infinite worth? Like, you know why money is worth it to you. You know why your kids are worth it to you. You know why your career is worth it. But why is knowing Christ infinitely worth it? Infinitely worth it. Unlike these other things that they're not bad things. They're just not ultimate things. So, that's the exchange to make. Um, and, and here's what I want to say about this exchange to make, I think I have this other phrase before I get into uh, the gospel to embrace. Our joy is most vulnerable when it isn't rooted in what's most valuable. That's why we need to make this exchange. That's why many of us haven't experienced joy during this prolonged season, COVID-19, racial unrest, the reason our joy has diminished is because it hasn't been rooted in what's most valuable. And some of us just need to confess to this and own it. Of course our joy has been vulnerable. We've been placing it in things that aren't as valuable as the infinite worth of knowing Christ. No condemnation, because here's the gospel to embrace. And hopefully this is ministering to you at this point. Hopefully you're encouraged. I haven't even got to the best part. The pathways to intimacy are coming. But, I mean, gospel to embrace. You're saying that's not the best part? Okay, this is the best part too. Okay, it's the gospel. I'd be crucified if I didn't say this was the best part. Here's the gospel to embrace. I no longer count on my own righteousness through obeying the law. Rather, I become righteous through faith in Christ. 
For God's way of making us right with himself depends on faith. He says in another passage, For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And this not from yourselves. It is a gift from God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Paul is so consistent with what he believes is the good news of Jesus Christ. I become righteous through faith in Christ. Friends, this is the good news. Bad news. COVID cases going up. Deaths going up. Having to go backwards in terms of opening things and closing things again. People who should be held accountable for murder aren't being held accountable. Bad news everywhere we turn. Bad news as it relates to the political situation in our country. The good news is, regardless of all that bad news, the gospel to embrace, and I just wonder if you've embraced it this past week, that you become righteous through faith in Christ Jesus. What does that mean? You are right with God through faith in Jesus. Come on, somebody. When is the last time, Christian, that you had a praise break in your house, that you gave a shout unto the Lord, that you had a moment of worship and gratitude because you remembered that you were righteous through faith in Christ, not through any righteous act of your own, not on remaining righteous, not on going to church, but literally only through faith in Christ for God's way of making us right with himself depends on going to church. No. Depends on being a good mom. No. Depends on managing your finances right. No. Depends on voting for the right person. No. Depends on being anti-racist and being woke in all the ways that we should be anti-racist and woke. No. Not even that. Our righteousness is through faith in Jesus Christ alone. So, here's the point here. Righteousness is given by faith, not earned through works. That's the gospel to embrace. And so here's the question to consider. How often do you meditate on this glorious good news? Come on, church family. Come on. I believe our joy is directly proportional to our awareness of the gospel. Our joy, your joy, is directly proportional to your ongoing, everyday awareness of the good news that righteousness is given by faith and not earned through works. But Ed, but my, my kids are acting crazy. Okay, I know. But just think about how God gave you righteousness through faith in Jesus. You think if he took care of your biggest problem of righteousness, he's not going to work with you with your other problems. That if he gave me righteousness, that he's going to take care of all my situations. That if he gave me righteousness, he'll take care of justice, we'll work towards it, but that's ultimately in his Hands. How often are you thinking about the good news of Jesus Christ as opposed to the bad news that's coming through your news feeds? Now, that's the glorious gospel. Just in case that doesn't do it for you, Paul closes with two pathways. Because what he says here, right? The infinite value of knowing Christ. So what we're talking about, how can we have more joy, rejoice in the Lord, just follow the, rejoice in the Lord is the imperative. How do you rejoice in the Lord? You gotta know Christ. Put aside all the other stuff. Don't lean on all the other stuff, but prop up knowing Christ as the most valuable possession. If he's most valuable, your joy won't be vulnerable. Joy in the Lord, rejoice in the Lord. How do you rejoice in the Lord? Know Christ. Here's the last question. How do I know Christ? How do I know Christ? If knowing Christ is a supreme thing, infinite worth, I need to rejoice in that, 
How do I know Christ? Well, Paul lays it out, and he gives us two pathways. Let's buckle in. Let's buckle in and finish this message strong. How can we then know Christ? If knowing Christ is of infinite worth, how can we know Him? Let's take a look at what he says. I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised Him from the dead. I want to suffer with Him. Keywords in blue. Use blue for the keywords. I want to suffer with Him, sharing in His death, so that one way or another, I will experience the resurrection from the dead. What are the two pathways to intimacy? Two pathways to knowing Christ. They're in yellow. Know the mighty power that raised Him from the dead and share in His death. I know you like the first one, but you don't like the second one. Know the mighty power that raised Him from the dead Share in his death, and it's, it's almost like sharing in his death is sandwiched in between the power that raised him from the dead, I want to suffer with him, sharing in his death, so that one way or another I will experience the resurrection from the dead. It's a resurrection sandwich. The problem is this resurrection sandwich has suffering right in the middle of it. And the problem is Paul lets us clearly know you can't know Christ without this resurrection sandwich. If you really want to know Christ, you need to eat the whole sandwich. The bread is just going to leave you wanting more. The bread is just going to leave you parched. You actually need the meat of suffering to appreciate the joy of the resurrection. Now, this commentary that works this out, it just says it much more beautifully than I ever could. But I pray that as I read Kent Hughes' comments, and he references a guy named Carl Barth, as I read their comments on this text, you will embrace the suffering and the resurrection that's required to knowing Christ. Let's look, take a look at what Kent Hughes said. Suffering for Christ, then, is a divine gift. It is a sign of sacred intimacy with Christ. The grace of being, this is incredible, the grace of being permitted to believe in Christ is surpassed by the grace of being permitted to suffer for Him, of being permitted to walk the way of Christ with Christ Himself to the perfection of fellowship with Him. Did you catch that? Take your phone out and take a picture of this slide because you're going to need to meditate on it a little bit more. Suffering for Christ is a divine gift, a sign of sacred intimacy. Why? Because when we suffer, we go from the grace of being permitted to believe in Christ, and what's greater than believing in Christ, and that's a grace, is the grace of being permitted to suffer for Him. Why? Because in suffering for Him, we walk his way with Him, thus perfecting our fellowship with Him. See, don't you feel most connected to people who have suffered like you've suffered? There's an intimacy that increases with someone you know when you realize you have suffered like they've suffered. Don't you have the least amount of intimacy with people who you don't feel like know the first thing about the type of suffering you've gone through? You have the least amount of intimacy with people who you feel like have no idea of what you've gone through. Yet we want to have no idea of what Jesus has gone through. He's perfecting your fellowship with Him by allowing you to suffer so you could just have a taste of His suffering. I hope this is ministering to you. Kent Hughes goes on to say, on the next slide, he goes on to say, oh, oh you put it up here, okay, sorry. The fellowship of Christ's suffering moves the believer, this is big too, beyond the role of the beneficiary of Christ's death 
to a sharer in Christ's sufferings. I'm not just a beneficiary of what Jesus did for me on a cross. In suffering, I'm sharing it with him. The suffering that comes to a Christian as a Christian is not a sign of God's neglect, but rather proof that grace is at work in his or her life, sacred intimacy. <laughs> I know some of you are like, I don't want sacred intimacy. <laughs> he can keep that sacred intimacy for himself. What if the hardest thing you're going through is the very proof that God wants to know you and wants you to know him like never before. I want you to just locate in your mind for just a moment the hardest thing. The thing that you've actually been praying away. The things you get other to pray for you for. Nothing wrong with that. But what if the thing that for so long we've, we've tried to pray away is the very road by which Jesus wants to become more intimate with you because you are going to more intimately know what he went through on the cross for all of us. Now, that's the pathway of suffering. Can we talk about the resurrection, Ed? Can we talk about the resurrection? Absolutely. Here's, here's some comments on this. Paul's language indicates a process in which Personal crosses produce a series of mini resurrections that take Paul ever deeper in his personal knowledge of Christ. Personal crosses that lead to mini resurrections. The problem is, I know, there's no resurrection without death. <laughs> it wouldn't be called resurrection, it would just be called, he's still living, right? What makes a resurrection a resurrection is the fact that something was crucified. Something died. There was loss. There was a cross to bear. So it's this ongoing cycle that God uses so that we know him deeply. We go deeper in his suffering, and so we know him in his suffering. But when we suffer, a resurrection follows, and so we now know him in his resurrection. And then we know him in his suffering, and we know him in his resurrection. And we know him in his suffering, and we know him in his resurrection. From glory to glory to glory, through our suffering, we know Jesus Christ more. Praise the Lord. And so what I want to do as I begin to shut this down is I just want to show you how this has worked out in my life. I want to show you the crosses. Many of you have been walking with me throughout the last several years, so you know these crosses. But maybe I haven't given you enough insight into the resurrections that have taken place. But I can preach this from the bottom of my heart because I know it is true. The suffering that I have gone through has led me to an intimacy and a knowing of Jesus Christ that I couldn't have had otherwise. And that knowing and that intimacy is, brings me much more joy than the circumstances never of have, having happened to me in the first place. Really quickly, and, and we'll shut this down. A couple years ago, lost the sight in my right eye. Pseudomonas, lights out. Right eye, can't see to this day, super blurry. I had bad eyes to begin with, but they're just worse now. On top of that, I was supposed to get a surgery, told you about some of that. Unfortunately, the OR is booked. Who knows when my surgery will be? Who knows when, when this will be able to get fixed? I talked about this, I think, during the, one, one of the times, though. So it's suffering, for real. I mean, it was physical suffering. I was screaming out, honey, honey, my eye, my eye. My wife was like, I love my wife, but she was just like, ah, you're fine, until it became like, guck all over my eye and then she was like okay maybe you're not fine <laughs> but what did I tell you I might have lost half of my sight but in terms of the vision of seeing God empathizing with other people that was a mini resurrection 
The cross of losing my eyesight resulted in a resurrection of my vision to empathize, of my vision to mourn with those who mourn, who have been impacted by sickness. Over the last year in particular, we have had to lead various people in our church People who have been rolling with our church for a while through issues with sexual immorality. I have had to walk with four couples through infidelity in the last couple of years, last several years. Two in the last year in particular. Hard times. Definitely a cross to bear to step in as a pastor in the middle of those situations Husbands cheating on wives and trying to lead them to a point of reconciliation. What can I say today? I could say today that all four of those marriages have been reconciled. There is resurrection. Those marriages that once for a moment seem dead, dead in the water. There's no chance we're living together again. There's no chance we're sleeping together again. And now those marriages have intimacy in them by the power of our resurrection Savior. Many of you know of a situation that we're dealing with with the family that has a husband in prison right now because of sexual immorality. What can I say? That is a cross. That is a cross for this family. That is a cross for us as a church family to walk with them through. What is the resurrection in this? I could say that this man is being healed from the inside out. In his sin, in the recognition of his sin, he is being healed of things that have been hidden in his life for many, many years. God is giving him a supernatural peace, even about having to uh, uh, face extended time in prison. God is giving him a peace. In regards to the wife of this person, God is giving her peace and strength to walk through this season with joy, even in the midst of trial. That's a resurrection. When I talk to these two people, I see the power of God at work in them in something that seems so dead. I've had dear family, friends leave our church, some for great reasons, others for not so great reasons. How do I see the Lord resurrecting these hard things? I see Him using them in other places. I see him ministering to them elsewhere. I see God bringing people into our church who did similar things and who can do similar things. I see God resurrecting anyways. My wife's cancer, our inability to bear children. As many of you know, she had to have a hysterectomy. The dream of us having children naturally crucified, dead. What has been resurrected? My wife's faith in Jesus. My wife's faith in her Savior is stronger because she's held fast to Him when some of the most important things to her have been taken away. And she's found that even though these things have been taken away, that Jesus is enough. And now she has a stronger walk with her Savior. And I have the resurrection of seeing my wife's faith blossom right before my eyes. It's not Edward as the pastor leading her or having any influence on that. It's seeing the Holy Spirit of God work beautifully in the life of my wife. That's resurrection power for me. Yes, we've we've had to carry that cross, but the resurrection of what God is doing in my wife's faith brings me Tremendous joy. Leading church to racial reconciliation. This has been a burden. Why? Because it's hard. It's hard. Because we've sinned against each other. And then when it comes to racial reconciliation, we keep sinning against each other. Y'all are crazy. Y'all are crazy. I'm crazy. In the middle of all it, I'm sinning against you. But what's the resurrection? Seeing 
black people reach out to white people, seeing white people reach out to black people, seeing Asians reach out to black people and apologize and say, I'm sorry, and say, I don't want to do it that way no more. I see what I didn't see before. The cross of being called out for being racist leads to the resurrection of a changed heart. And then hopefully you could see after all this, I want to quit. <laughs> I want to quit. But my cross is that I can't, I can't. I can't leave you if I want to do. The Lord won't let me do it. The Lord won't let me do it. Because let me just tell you this, even in the midst of all this, and not to whatever, but in the midst of all this, word can still get back to me how I'm not doing enough. Pouring myself out in all these ways, and word comes back to me that there are ways and I'm not doing enough. And, and they're right in many ways. But let me just tell you, when you get word that you're not doing enough, even after pouring yourself out in all these ways, it makes you want to quit. But you can't. Because Jesus said, follow me. What's the resurrection? Here I am. I'm here. And I love you. I love you and I love what I get to do. And I'm still standing. And I'm still believing in Jesus. And I'm still preaching the gospel when I'm empty, when I'm laid out and I have nothing left, I now can experience the resurrection of the Holy Spirit working in me to preach this gospel anyways. What I'm doing right now before your eyes is a miracle because everything in me doesn't want to do it right now. How could I know that type of resurrection power without the death of wanting to quit, realizing that Jesus' faithfulness to me is more precious than my faithfulness to Him. Last thought, and we're, at, we're done to sing this song. Knowing Christ requires carrying personal crosses that lead to many resurrections. Personal crosses. I've got my list. And I have an accompanying list of resurrections that have happened as a result of my list. The to-do for today, the final question is this. What are your personal crosses that have led to your many resurrections? Something tells me. If you sit down this week and don't just be a hearer of the word, but be a doer of the word, and you think about the deaths you've had to experience over the last four months or beyond, and then you look at, but how has God produced something new in me as a result? Joy can return. Knowing Christ can be more real. Here's the summary. Five points. Make Jesus your source of joy. Don't root your joy in your righteousness. Root your joy in what's infinitely valuable. Jesus, not in what's temporarily valuable. Righteousness is given by faith in Jesus, not earned through works. Knowing Christ requires carrying personal crosses that lead to many resurrections. Folks, as I close here, what I want to say is it's all about Jesus. Joy is all about Jesus. I think in the book of Philippians, uh, Paul uses the word joy, I think 16 times or something like that, but the Lord is used 48 times. Basically, the big idea over the scope of the book is that Paul's joy is in the Lord. That the Lord is the reason for Paul's joy. And friends, if there's anything that we need to pay attention to as it relates to our joy, is that we've taken our eyes off Jesus. That Jesus has moved from the center to the periphery. The news has moved to the center. Circumstances has moved to the center. <coughs> Unfulfilled dreams has moved to the center. Let's move Jesus back to the center. Let's move Jesus and make Jesus the point of our lives. And let's sing that to him now. Let's bow our heads, let's pray, and prepare, be prepared to respond in worship. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name.
Lord, by the power of your spirit, would you help us with two things? One, would you help us to see the infinite worth of knowing Christ? Help us to see that, God. That, that, that's a spiritual thing that needs to happen. Our physical minds, eyes, cannot see the infinite worth of knowing Christ. So God, by your spirit, would you help us see that? And then number two, as a church filled with people who does want to know you more, Lord, I ask that we would embrace suffering and resurrection, that we would know you in your suffering so that we could know you in your resurrection. Help us to desire, to even embrace knowing you in your suffering so that we can know you in your resurrection. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Why don't you stand? Why don't you stand? Maybe you need to kneel. Maybe you need to kneel. You need to repent for taking Jesus off center. And let's make this the prayer of our hearts. Let's finish strong. Kids, if you're there, let's finish strong. Jesus at the center. Kids, let me just tell you, Jesus is what's most valuable. Acceptance from your friends, having the things you want, the video games, I know, I love it all too, but Jesus is most valuable. If you could get this at your age, it will save you so much time, so much energy, so much grief to put Jesus first. Let's stand and sing to Jesus now.